trust is a powerful force in our world and trust is a powerful force at work as well. That's why it is to our advantage to understand how trust works and what if you could learn more about it from an expert in trust research? What would you like to learn from that? What would you like to understand better about trust? What would you like to know about how to build trust? And perhaps even how to repair it when it's been broken. If you care about any of those things, if those questions raise your curiosity even a little, then you're in the right place. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast, you could have been with us live, or more accurately, you could be with us for future live episodes on your favorite social media channel. To do that, so you know when they're taking place, so you can get it in your calendar and join us, you just need to join one of our um, groups on either Facebook or LinkedIn to learn about that, find out what's going on, be on top of things, and even interact with me there. You can do those things at remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook, which will point you there, or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn, which will point you to the LinkedIn group. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by our Remarkable Masterclasses. Pick from 13 important life and leadership skills to help you become more effective, productive, and confident while overcoming some of a leader's toughest challenges. Learn more and sign up at Remarkable Podcast, excuse me, Remarkable Masterclass.com. Remarkable Masterclass.com. Now I'm going to bring in our guest. And here he is. If you're watching, you can now see him. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Peter H. Kim. He's a professor of management and organization at the Marshall School of Business, the University of Southern California. His research has been published in numerous scholarly journals. He's received 10 national and international awards. He's been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and on NPR. He serves as the senior editor for organizational science and is on the editorial boards for the Academy of Management Review and, and Negotiation and Conflict Management Research. He is also a past associate editor for the National, excuse me, Academy of Management Review and the Journal of Trust Research. You didn't even know if such a thing existed. He's the past chair of the Academy of Management's Conflict Management Division. And he is, to our point today, the author of a brand new, wonderful book, How Trust Works, The Science of How Relationships Are Relationships are built, broken, and repaired. And um, since this will go live on the 17th of January, uh, and whether you're with us live doing this in November or whether you're with us in the podcast in the first couple of weeks, if you will reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, I'm interested in winning a copy of Peter's book, I'm going to give two copies of this book away. Not the one I read, but two other copies. This book will be given away about the 1st of February. So you just got to go on LinkedIn and say hello and tell me that you want to be entered in the drawing to win one of the books. And we will put you in that drawing. And I will let the people who are winners know and we'll send out those books. Enough with all of that. Peter, welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you, Kevin. It's uh, great to be here with you today. So let's see, we've got people here from Minneapolis, from Florida in, and Orlando, also in Florida, but we also have people from Pakistan and from Michigan, far-flung folks joining us today. We're glad that you're all here. Um, and if you've got a question or comment, please ask it. So Peter, uh, tell us a little bit about your journey. Like most people who are listening probably didn't even know there was such a thing, really, as a trust researcher, and yet that's what you are. And so sort of what leads you to that, uh, just a very short sense of your journey that leads you to this place and what leads you to writing this book? Well, like many of the people who are uh, listening, uh, I have been fascinated by people uh, understanding, uh, uh, trying to understand how people tick and how people relate to one another. And, uh, Part of that was uh, the result of my having grown up in many parts of the world and, and moved around quite a bit. And uh, that has exposed me to all sorts of different communities and the need to uh, 
become members, a, a member of a new community again and again and again. And so uh, I became a, a very uh, a deliberate observer of <laughs> social interactions and, and communities and relationships. And, and so that's what inspired my interest in how people perceive one another, how our identities are uh, determined, uh, how they're formed, uh, how we misperceive one another, how we uh, get these things wrong. And, and so that was the basis of my journey uh, as I was uh, uh, starting my PhD uh, in organizational behavior. Um, that became a driving impetus for my work. And so you might put it under the category of impression management if you are, you know, interested um, in the, uh, you know, applied management side. Uh, psychologists would re refer to this as identity negotiation. How do we reconcile our different views about one another? Uh, but what, regardless of the label, that's the broad umbrella. And, and within that broad umbrella, the topic of trust is clearly an essential uh, component. And, and I can tell you that when, when the advanced reader copy of this book showed up in my mail, um, uh, I was immediately taken by the title because trust is such an important thing, as I mentioned in the open, uh, for all of us, and certainly for us as leaders to have a better understanding of how it's created and what we need to do to build it and all of those things that, uh, you know, once I dove into the book enough to say, yeah, I want to have Peter on, I've been looking forward uh, to our conversation. So we should probably start, though, with that word trust. It's a word we all use. And, and yet I, I think that you can help us from your unique perspective describe what you mean by it. Like if we're going to have this conversation for the next 30 minutes or whatever about trust, how it works, why don't you start by telling us what it actually is? It's a great place to start because everyone thinks they know what it is, and yet we can easily talk past one another without uh, a more rigorous definition of this concept. Uh, social scientists refer to this uh, concept as a, a willingness to make oneself vulnerable in situations involving risk based on positive beliefs about the other. Uh, and so that's a, that's a mouthful in, in terms of uh, definition. Uh, but it underscores a, a few key things. Uh, one, uh, there has to be risk uh, in, in that situation, right? So if, if you have uh, encountered a situation where there's no potential downside, then there's no potential for trust. Uh, there's no need for trust. And in fact, a lot of times we operate in the world by trying to reduce risk rather than build trust. Uh, and by by reducing the need to make ourselves vulnerable, uh, the other element of this is the trust. I think I, I'm going to stop you right there. I think we could probably spend the whole conversation on that last statement. So, so <laughs> say, not that we're going to, but I want you to say it again because I know that when people are listening to a podcast, they're doing lots of things. So sometimes I need to sort of help them underline something important. And you just said it. Sometimes we spend our time trying to. Uh, trying to manage our social relations by reducing risk rather than building trust. And uh, and this is a focus of uh, many HR organizations, for example, right? So there are uh, lots of attempts to uh, implement policies and, and use guidelines in a way where we don't have to trust people because- We'll just make it a rule. Exactly. Exactly. And that may seem like uh, a straightforward way to go. Uh, but the problem is that over time, with more and more rules, you essentially create uh, an iron cage where people just don't have the ability to navigate these situations flexibly, uh, to be as creative as they might be, uh, and to really engage in one another in, in ways that the rules don't protect us from, right? And so what, what do you do when the rule is limited? And most rules are, uh, that's where trust comes in. When you have trust, then you have a lot more flexibility. Uh, you have the opportunity to avoid that kind of bureaucratic nightmare that weighs so many large organizations down. So I'll admit that sometimes I, I mean, there's lots of reasons to like a book, 
right? And one of them is that it says stuff that you agree with uh, or that it validates your belief. Well, one of the things that you talk about early in the book validates validated my belief and what I've actually been teaching for a long time, but you put a lot more research around it. We'll get to research in a second. But I, I want you to talk about some of the misconceptions because now I said, here's what trust is, but there are some misconceptions and you talk about them pretty early in the book that I think are critical um, if we're going to figure out how to navigate all this better. Mm -hmm. Well, so the whole book is designed to challenge our misconceptions. <laughs> sure, <laughs> for sure. Honest. But there are a couple I think that you talk about early that I think are especially sort of almost overarching, right? Sure. So uh, one that, that I bring up early in the book is the idea that trust starts at zero and only builds gradually over time as we get to know one another. And uh, this is based on the, the premise that, that, that has been dominant in not only our popular thinking, but also in the scientific literature. Uh, and so there's been a strong emphasis uh, uh, on this idea that people are opportunistic, uh, that they will try to get away with whatever they can if you give them any opportunity. And so then the natural default is how do we protect ourselves from that, right? By, by building in these regulations and, uh, and laws and contracts as a way of diffusing those tendencies. Uh, and it turns out that, um, first of all, we don't trust at, at levels of zero <laughs> at the beginning of a relationship. Uh, the evidence indicates that our initial trust is actually surprisingly high in, in many situations. And that's for a variety of reasons. Um, so uh, many societies have laws, rules, and norms uh, that provide a basis for trust. They call it uh, institutional trust. You, you believe in society, it, it's been organized in a way where it, it generally makes more sense to cooperate rather than take advantage of people. If you steal, if you, you know, uh, break into a, the, you know, a shop and, 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 and do all these things, well, it's not going to be in your best interest. So to the extent that societies have that infrastructure, that lays one foundation. Uh, another foundation is that we, uh, many of us have an inclination to trust based on our dispositions. Uh, so the, the, this disposition to trust is, you know, it, it varies uh, amongst people, uh, but what it does is increase the baseline level of trust uh, across the average person to, uh, above, it brings it above zero. And, and it turns out that this is, a beneficial disp disposition. So the evidence indicates that people who are more trusting tend to be better off. They're happier. Uh, they are sought out uh, as a relationship partner by both trusting and non-trusting others. Uh, and it enables all sorts of constructive actions. So that, that belief that people are trustworthy uh, in general uh, can be a, a very positive force. And then the, the third factor is that we we gain all sorts of cues uh, about one another in these initial interactions. And so you and I, Kevin, have just met a short time ago, a few minutes ago, <laughs> and yet there are all sorts of cues that, that we gained about one another that, that put us at ease, right? And, 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 and that's the case in many relationships, things like reputations credentials? Where, did we come from the same town? Did we go to the same school? All sorts of ways in which we can connect with one another, help elevate that trust. Um, yeah. And the interesting thing about this is, you know, like, you know, you listen to podcasts in preparation, you know, that I've read mo the largest percentage of the book. And so there's that, but then there's, we do, have, we didn't go to the same school. We don't have the same uh, background, but but we both are authors. We've got a lot. There's a lot of things that we actually very quickly could find that we have as commonalities that can help us with the context of raising that initial trust far above, far above zero. Um, so a question came in and, I, and I'm going to go ahead and ask it now because it's related to where we're headed. So let me just pull it out here and I'll put it all up here. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of, uh, paraphrase it a little. The question is, is, is trust absolute or can it be partial? I, only, I trust them. I only trust them somewhat. I trust them. Like ha, ha, this person's Eric says he, he's always said it's sort of yes or no, no halfway. But yeah, one of the things you and I talked about before we started, before we went live was the fact that this book is all about nuance. 
So I'll put I'll put Eric's question back up and just let you talk to it for a second. Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, so uh, the way uh, trust is studied is on a continuous scale. So you can trust a bit, you can have uh, uh, a lot of trust, you can have some trust, and it's also contingent on the situation. So uh, over uh, you know the, the decades that, that this work has been going on, uh, researchers have identified many bases for trust. Right, so you can trust someone to be very good at uh, doing your taxes, but you may not necessarily trust them <laughs> to to be great at uh, providing medical advice. Right, <laughs> I'm not so, gonna have them to watch my dog, but I'll let them do my taxes. Right, exactly. So there are all sorts of bases for trust, uh, and so depending on the situation, you may trust them more or less, depending on the task or situation you're exposing yourself too. And then it also, you know, we, we also need to reintroduce this idea of risk, right? So you may be dealing with the same person in the same situation, but the level of risk may change. So if, if the incentive structure has been changed so that suddenly there is less risk, you may be willing to engage with them more. Uh, so it seems like you trust them more. Uh, through your behavior, you're engaging in more trustworthy behavior. Uh, and yet your perception of that person hasn't changed, your perception of risk has changed. So th there are lots of different components uh, that affect our willingness to trust. I like to think about it as kind of like the, uh, it, I don't know if you've seen these audio mixing boards in studios yeah. where you can you know, increase or decrease the volume of each of the different instruments and you know, including the overall volume. So all these things combine uh, to create the overall sound that we might have. Uh, but that combination matters uh, depending on the situation you're in. So I think that takes us to one of the, I think one of the big ideas of the book that I think is, I, it's important in general. And I think for us as leaders, since this is a leadership podcast, uh, I think it's especially useful. And I'm just going to put it on the screen and make the general comment and let you sort of go on this because you talk a lot about the idea of competence versus integrity, real and perceived. And so talk, take us down this path a little bit, because I think it's super interesting and really important. Absolutely. So competence and integrity are a, a big focus of my research because they are the two most important determinants of trust across situations. Uh, regardless of whether they're superiors, subordinates, coworkers, and so on. And uh, the other uh, thing that that drives uh, so, that's driven so so many uh, of the studies I've run is that uh, beyond the fact that these are the two most important determinants of trust, we also weigh information about these components quite differently. Uh, so we have, these things, these biases in our mental basement uh, that are the product of our evolution that leads us to exhibit strong asymmetries with uh, these two different traits. Uh, so for matters of competence, for example, uh, we weigh positive information about competence much more heavily than negative information about competence. So if you're a baseball player and you hit a home run, you're considered a home run hitter, even though you might strike out afterwards that one positive instance outweighs the negative instance. Uh, but for matters of integrity, that relationship's reversed. So we have a negative bias when it comes to integrity. Uh, so if you're caught uh, embezzling from your company once <laughs> and you respond by saying, well, I did not embezzle yesterday. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I only did it once, well, yeah, but. Right? <laughs> Yeah, so that one negative instance is considered so diagnostic, so informative, that it will outweigh uh, the, the sense, any positive information about integrity uh, that you might offer as a, a counterbalance. And so they, those asymmetries are, are critical because so many of our attempts to navigate these complex situations in the world activate both positive and negative information. So if, if something goes wrong, you might apologize. And we think apologies are good, and in, in general, they can be, but they convey both positive information about 
remorse and negative information about guilt, right? And so which one are you going to weigh more? It depends on the type of violation, how you view that violation. So when I think, again, I, I think this is, the, this is the, for me as a reader was the most fascinating part of the book. And, I, and I think about this as a leader, right? So I'm just going to say something and then I'll let you just take it from there. So, you know, societally like everyone who's listening has all sorts of experiences with people who was who have been their boss some positive some negative and yet societally there's a pretty strong negative bias right like can't trust the boss who's the villain in most of the movies like all of those kind you know horrible bosses was a popular movie they never made a movie called awesome boss like so like i'm curious what you're research says or what your advice is for us as leaders when maybe because of the hat we're wearing and, and this will be more true for some of our team members than for others right but they're carrying with them this a bias about leaders to start with that might be placing integrity at a deficit to start thoughts of agree disagree and thoughts about what to do with that if you do agree so I've devoted uh, a full chapter to this problem in the book, uh, and it it is uh, a thorny issue, absolutely. And uh, let me identify three three wrinkles that we need to keep uh, in mind. First, uh, what what you raised, Kevin, is spot on. Uh, there is a bias uh, that that leads us to believe that when a leader commits uh, uh, some sort of violation, uh, it is much more likely to be a matter of integrity than a matter of competence. So, you know, some of the, the book is focused on how do we make this distinction because it's, it's not so clear cut. Well, it turns out that for leaders, uh, we are prone to believe it's a matter of integrity they did this deliberately, uh, and, and and it's because we believe that leaders have the power to do what they want, right? So with that, if they did something that uh, that violates our principles or violate does something wrong, uh, it must have been intentional. So that definitely sets them back. Um, that's that's really problematic. The uh, second consideration uh, is that well, another way in which we make this distinction between whether or not something's a matter of competence or integrity depends on our motivation to preserve the relationship. So when we want to maintain a relationship with someone, like for example, if your spouse does something wrong, we are motivated to see how it, it was a matter of competence rather than integrity. It's not a reflection of them being horrible people, it was an error, right? And we strive to see virtues in in those faults that that we uh, might see in our partner, and so that motivation is something that can apply to leaders as well. Uh, what? Why are they a leader? If they're a leader because they are valuable, they're bringing important resources to the organization. We we uh, depend on this leader for uh, you know important things. Then suddenly we have a motivation to to reconsider. Maybe it's not such a clear cut matter of integrity. Maybe that you know there are things that I, I'm not seeing uh, that that really uh, speak to this being a matter of competence. So depending on the motivation, uh, we we may shift one way or the or, or the other. If someone's a leader and a bad leader, an unliked leader, that just exacerbates the problem, right? Absolutely. <laughs> That would not be anybody that's here, Peter. Uh, exactly. Because we're, we, you know, this is probably a bit. Hopefully, is a little bit of a self-selected uh, <laughs> audience here of people that are trying to be more effective, working at it, and all that. But, but that's a really important point. And, and oh, by the way, even if you're pretty effective and pretty well liked by much of your team, teams don't make these decisions. Individuals make these dis these dis distinctions that you're talking about, right? So yeah, generally on average, you might be doing okay, but you might have a, you might have someone who really uh, is, is 
is thinking this and and calculating this, if you will, in the way that Peter's talking about. So it's still extremely problematic. Yeah, so there's heterogeneity in the audience. And so some might want to see this as a, an honest mistake and others might want to attribute this to you lacking integrity. And, and that is very hard to overcome. And so, uh, but the good news is uh, for those that are in the audience that, you know, those who are striving to cultivate good relationships uh, with uh, others in the organization, if there's in positions of power, if they're in that leadership position because they are a valued member, uh, that will help buffer this uh, initial problem to some degree. And then th the third issue is that um, it turns out that, you know, let's take uh, ap apologies, for example, attempts to show remorse. Let's say you screwed up and you want to convey that you're going to fix this moving forward. It turns out that uh, another hurdle leaders face is that we see those expressions of remorse as less authentic when they're conveyed by a leader than by someone who is who is. Uh, they're local. just saying what they've got to say. <laughs> That's right, and in fact, they are in a position of leader because they are good at managing their emotions. So they must be expressing those emotions strategically. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but this is an interesting thing. I mean, you spend some time in the book talking about effective apologies. And uh, and, and I, I don't think any, any of us listening could think about this for a second. I'm going to let you just sort of talk about effective apologies for a sec. But I want you all to think about this from the context of if you listen to the news or to the sporting news when an athlete or a coach messes something up either in the game, you know, in the sport or outside of the sport. And then there are apologies or politicians or business leaders making apologies to your point. And then people will start to say, well, they, people will start to dissect those apologies to determine how they think how effective they were in effect. And I think, what you can give us is a little bit of a way to to be more effective in our apologies if it's genuine, but also to help understand that conversation that happens in the world when people hear one, because not everyone sees them the same way. So uh, talk about that for a second, if you would. <clears throat> Absolutely. So uh, there has been research on what makes an apology more effective. And so there are a variety of components that researchers have identified, you know, uh, an offer of repair, an expression of remorse, uh, a request for forgiveness, and so on. And, and, and what they found is that the more of these components uh, that are included, the more effective an apology can be overall. So that's a pretty intuitive idea. But what it, that work, uh, does not emphasize enough is that it is the context in which the apology is conveyed. Uh, that, it, that context is as if not more important than the, the, the way the apology is constructed. And, and that gets to the initial distinction that we're talking about, whether it's considered a matter of confidence or integrity. Um, if you convey an apology for what's considered a matter of competence, then the apology can be very effective because we weigh the positive signals of that apology more heavily than the negative confirmation of guilt. But if it's considered a matter of integrity, even the most effective apology in terms of, you know, tapping into all the components <laughs> will do very little good because people will focus on how the apology confirms guilt and they will discount any signals that this will be corrected in the future. And, and that's that's a battlefield that that is actively engaged in most of these social scandals that, that occur in the news, but that people pay uh, inadequate attention to. Um, and, or they might just try to say, oh, you know, it it, it, it was it was a mistake and, and just leave it there. But whether or not it's viewed, this violation is viewed as a mistake or an intentional transgression meant to get away with something, that is uh, it, a, a, a very serious arena for debate where different people will have very different views uh, based on you know their their inclinations, their past experiences, you name it. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, so you and I, we could have a really long conversation because there's a lot of fascinating and useful 
stuff uh, in your research and in the book. Uh, but given that it is the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, I want to ask a couple of more things, more specific for leaders before we sort of close out. Uh, and the first of those is, what can you tell us or what does the research tell us that might be useful when we think about building trust across a team or across an organization, right? We've been talking about this, at least mostly we've been thinking about this through the lens of how I trust you or and vice versa, but how does this play out? And what do we as leaders need to know and think about when we think about this in terms of team or organizational trust? I would probably start with the observation that a lack of trust is almost like a tax that you would have in your organization. It reduces efficiency because any, uh, uh, any, in, any mistrust will make people less willing to make themselves vulnerable, to, uh, to, uh, to invest in that team, invest in that organization, uh, and, and that's a problem. Uh, the other thing I would note is that, um, you know, this goes back to the very start of our conversation, you know, this idea that it, initial, some people have a predisposition to trust. Uh, well, when you, and one of the reasons why this is beneficial is that when you trust others, pe most people don't see this as an opportunity for exploitation. They see this trust as a precious resource to preserve for the future. So when you trust people, they want to prove you right. Yeah. And so as a leader, <laughs> the, you know, the, the, the first step is, is to create the conditions where people feel trusted uh, and so that they can actually prove you right. And, and, and so that can create this kind of uh, virtuous cycle. That can uh, yep, the upward, I call it an upward cycle. Right? Like I, I'm working to I'm working to earn the trust that you've offered me, and you're doing the same. And upward we upward we step, right? Yeah, absolutely. Love that. Um, okay, so a lot of folks today are on teams that don't see each other every day, right? The virtual teams, hybrid teams, some some form of we're not all in the same place five days a week. Uh, what do we need to know, if anything, or what would you? I, again, I think it's nuanced, but what's what's a, what's a thing we need to especially remember if we're leading our team or having our interactions, our relationships at a distance? I would put emphasis on this idea that we need to set create an infrastructure, a social infrastructure, a normative infrastructure that allows trust to flourish. And so a lot of the things that can happen in, in many organizations uh, is uh, a misunderstanding. There, there's a miscommunication uh, that happens because people sort of don't have the same expectations for what should happen moving forward. Uh, that's why face-to-face -face interactions are useful because it can help. It's the best way to reconcile sure. those differences. Well, you know, uh, long distance work, uh, that makes it, a bit more of a challenge, but you can still work at that. And, and maybe it, it just tells us that we need to work harder to establish these expectations so that uh, the expectations, the, uh, the incentives and so on, so that everyone's on the same page. And to the extent that you've done that, uh, I have no real concern about long distance you know, work being any more problematic. I have collaborations with co-authors around the world uh, on high stakes projects and they go well because we have the infrastructure in place. Yeah, I love that. I think that's fantastic. So I'm going to shift gears. I'm looking at the, at the time. And, and as I said, I know we could go a lot longer, but we, we need to sort of wrap up. And so I've got three or four more questions for you, Peter. And one of them is this shifting gears, admittedly, what do you do for fun? <laughs> well, uh, 
what I used to do uh, more. I don't is, have any fun anymore, everybody. Uh, but what I used to do, no, go ahead, go ahead. But I, I just moved uh, so to a new location. So I used to enjoy cycling quite a bit. Uh, and so uh, I'm in a new area and I'm trying to figure out wh where and how to, to enjoy that hobby more here. So I like to stay active. Uh, I'm doing more walking and exploring my neighborhood uh, now. Uh, but uh, that is the best. For me, uh, that's what I enjoy the most about traveling. Uh, my wife and I will just start walking and, and exploring how people live uh, in these different regions of the world. Perfect. And the only thing you knew I was going to ask you, um, what are you reading or what's something you've read recently? So one book uh, that I, I've enjoyed quite a bit was called The Moral Animal by Robert Wright. It is uh, by an evolutionary psychologist, and it really gets to this question about the, what is morality, you know? Um, you know, there, there are different books that, that tap into this question, but they take it from, uh, you know, this, this evolutionary perspective. And what they really underscore, uh, what the book really underscores is this idea that morality is what we do against our biology, right? When we make the choice to do uh, what isn't necessarily so, so easy. So um, it, it was a fascinating read from that perspective. The Moral Animal. And of course, the book that you want all of us to read is this one, How Trust Works, The Science of How Relationships Are Built, Broken and Repaired. Uh, where do you want to point people? Where, where can people learn more about the book, Peter? Where do you want to point them? Uh, anything that you want to, to point people to in relationship to your work and the book? So there is a website that I've created, peterhkim.com. Uh, so if you want to learn more about the book, uh, feel free to uh, take uh, a look at that website. Uh, it includes not only, uh, you know, places to, to order the book, but also, uh, you know, the, the various interviews I've done uh, about it up to this point. Love that, peterhkim.com, where you can learn more about Peter's work, the research, the book, and more. And uh, so before we go, now, everyone, the question that I will ask you, and it's a question I ask you every episode, and it's simply this, now what? What action will you take as a result of the last, in this case, 39 minutes? Like, what, were you, what will you take from this? What insights do you take that you will act on? Because if all we were today was sort of, hmm, that was interesting, or this was entertaining, while that's useful, it's not nearly as useful as you putting something into practice. And so whatever that might be for you, maybe it's that idea of thinking about how do I, how do I think about others that I interact with and am I viewing their mistakes as mistakes of competence or of integrity? Maybe it's that. Maybe it's this idea of thinking about uh, the fact that trust doesn't really start at zero and what does that mean for me as a leader or as a human? Maybe it's thinking about how you do uh, give, give apologies a little differently. I don't know what it is for you. The point is that if you take action on what you got today, you get far more from it than if you just consume the content. Peter, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. I've been looking forward to it. I'm glad we had the chance to have this conversation. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, likewise, I really enjoyed the conversation. And everybody, if you enjoyed this one, you know, you ought to come back next week because we'll be back again next week. And if you've been here before, then why don't you invite someone else? Wherever you're watching, we will continue to have episodes. And wherever you're watching or listening, you can go back to the archive of, oh, I don't know, 400 or so conversations just like this. I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll hit like. I hope you hit subscribe. You know all of those things. But most of all, I hope you'll be back next week for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.